Thank you for being here. So good to see you uh, as, as well as I can through this medium. Um, I assume you're all there, so please don't break my illusion. <laughs> At any rate, uh, that's just about my perception and my dedication and my sensibility about doing this in the first place. So since I'm on that topic... Let me speak briefly on something that, I don't know, I, it may trouble, it, may, it probably troubles each and one of, one of us without being in the forefront or well described or defined in our minds. But this idea that Buddhism is about oneness, that everything is... Uh, going through the same process. I talk about this all the time. We're all energy in myriad, unfathomable, uncountable, innumerable, right? These words of Buddhism, uh, potentials manifesting, and we're all in flux, all moving through time space, right? And so there's this mythology of oneness in, uh, Buddhism. And, um, that's a bit of a, a reaction-provoking kind of statement or thought. Because uh, I think for a lot of people who hear about and ridicule the idea of oneness in Buddhism is the idea of homogeneity, that everything's the same thing. And I want to disabuse you of that notion because that's not at all what Buddhism is saying. Our idea of oneness, if you will, is about a, a, uh, a one cohesive amongst all our differences perspective, right? It's about the mind, state of mind, Buddha. Your Buddhaness, my Buddhaness, our Buddhaness, Buddhaness is Buddhaness. It's one definition. However, because we're all our own group of manifestations of energies, potential energies, though we may share a great many components of energies, we all have water molecules in us. We all have, right? Gases, minerals, da 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 Those are the same in everything, not just humans, animals, rocks, plants, yeah? We share a lot of sameness, but that's not oneness. Because it's, it's really unfathomable when we talk about, or Nietzsche talks about, or Tendai talks about, Ichin and Sanzen, what we're talking about is that from this immense, incalculable pool of energetic manifestations of potentials and the repetition of them moment to moment, there are some potentials manifesting that are quite specific to a you and a me. Now, this is the tricky part because Buddhism identifies those as the identifying habits that we have of ID, identification, a you and a me-ness. Yeah? Shakyamuni knew this. 
This is, again, why he suggested that all of us study broadly, because each and every single one of the billions of human minds that are on the planet perceive, experience, see, hear, taste, feel, subtly different than one another. The differences are minute, but they can add up to pretty significant perceptual filters, which again are far removed from the initial energies, right? We construct our reality individual to our particular tendencies and conditions, our circumstances. Yeah? Cultures, race, sexes, all, you could say, in the scope of the totality of things, not much difference. But that doesn't mean they're not significant differences. And so the way we gain our insights toward Buddha, which is the same mind state, regardless of any life form, may take very different looking, different experiencing patterns, paths. Our path to Buddha may vary a little or greatly, but Buddha is Buddha. And so this idea of oneness can be greatly oversimplified and it can make you feel like well, I'm, darn it, I'm not the same as everything else. What are you saying, I'm a rock? See, it can be taken to the ridiculous. And so this is why I want to caution you about making statements like Buddhism is about oneness. Mm, not really. It's about seeing everything from a correct perspective. And there may be a oneness rhetoric around that idea but by no stretch of the imagination. In fact, Buddhism works excessively hard on trying to make this perceptive ideal accessible to anyone. That's been the goal since Siddhartha wanted to change the way we experienced our lives. Long before he became enlightenment, he was enlightened. He was working on this very idea. Is it even possible? He achieved it, and the rest of his life was spent teaching everyone else how they could achieve it as well. Albeit, he had to explain it conceptually, exhaustively, for 50 years, because everybody's different. And they each, each one of us has a different path to those insights that bring us to Myoho Renge Kyo. The experience of enlightenment. Yeah. So I hope that helps. Uh, it's interesting that as we continue in this uh, essay on gratitude, that Nietzsche is going to spend some time, arguably a lot of time in all of his writings, trying to disabuse people of mythologies, habit thinking, habit energies, uh, taking stories by some scholar of a few hundred years ago as real when we need to understand with our reasoning mind and our rational minds that stories are made to teach. They're not about actual events. And even if we look at those stories and understand them as stories, what are they truly indicating? And with our reason and rationale, how can we make them useful or not useful in our daily development for our insights into our path to Buddhahood? What you would call your Buddha wisdom. My Buddha wisdom is different than your Buddha wisdom. But if we share our insights with one another, 
we can gain further insights from those insights. That's the way the mind works. That's why there's this great benefit to Sangha. If we all have the same goal in mind, we can share insights and bring us all closer, right? But it's an individual development. My developments are not your developments, but my developments when shared can lead to your specific developments. We all have our individual patterns of energy and momentum, moment to moment, mo momentum to adjust, to filter, to nudge. Yeah. So the fallacy of Grandmaster Kobo in Chikaku, Nichiren calls out this, uh, at this time of the great drought in the second month of the first year of the Tensho era in 824. Venerable Shubin at first said meditations for rain, and in seven days it rained in Kyoto, but not in the country. Next, Grandmaster Kobo performed a ceremony for rain. In seven days there were no signs of rain at all, nor was a cloud seen for two weeks. Now again, understand he's talking about these claims that are in these stories, right? That are forming the background of who these great masters are, these personages of history for the students of those teachers. So you see, he's going to set this up. He's going to make a logical argument. Next, Grandmaster Kobo performed a ceremony for rain. In seven days, there were no signs of rain. There were no clouds for two weeks. On the 21st day, the emperor sent Wake no Matsuna to Shinsen En Pond to meditate. It says pray here, but. As a result, it kept raining for three days. Wow. I guess Wake no Matsuna knew what he was doing. Nevertheless, Grandmaster Kobo and his disciples claimed that this rain was in response to their meditations. You ever heard that argument among kids? Yeah, you were only able to do that because I did all the figuring out first. You, that's not your success, it's mine, really. Right? I mean, come on. We hear this amongst adults in different forms. We hear it all the time this appropriation of somebody else's success as being simply the expression of something you've laid the groundwork for. In some cases, that may be true, but do you understand the politics of the story here? <clears throat> so, it has been called Kobo's reign for 400 years since then. Kobo being the more politically powerful, the more connected personality, nobody argued with him. They said, oh, okay, so Waka, Wake no Matsuna, he, he just was like the last facilitator on the good work that you did. So it's Kobo's reign. I wonder how Wake Matsuna fed up, felt about that. <laughs> anyway. Grandmaster Jikaku claimed that he had shot the sun with an arrow in a dream. Here comes that story again. Obviously, really chaffs Nichiren, right? While Grandmaster Kobo deceived the people by saying that when he meditated for dispersing epidemics in the spring of the ninth year of the Conan era in 818, so this is what, uh, six years earlier, the great sun appeared at midnight right? His meditation was so powerful that the sun just appeared in the night sky at midnight. And this is the way stories folklore gets written, right? His people don't question it. They cease to understand the metaphor and they begin to understand it as fact. And this is how misinformation is transmitted from generation to generation, right?
However, during the 29 kalpas since the beginning of the world, 20 kalpas for creation and 9 kalpas for the kalpa of existence, the sun has never appeared at midnight. Right? Reality check. Hello. As for Grandmaster Chikaku's claim that he shot the sun in a dream, is it possible for us to find in the five or seven thousand fassils of Buddhist scripture or in the three thousand fassils of Confucianism in their canons any statements to the effect that a dream of shooting a sun is a lucky dream? Let's look at all the other claims of shooting the sun. What do they say with all these thousands of years of history of great men, not only Buddhist, but Confucian? We're, we're in China now. Think about this. An Ashura demon shot at the sun in a battle with Indra and his arrow returned to shoot out his own eye. Again, this is a folklore story. It doesn't portend well, this idea of shooting the sun, does it? King Chao of Yin shot the sun and ruined himself. Another long-standing piece of folklore. Doesn't end well, shooting the sun. In the reign of Emperor Jimu, Itsuse no Mokoto was shot in his hand in a battle again, Nagashin Ninhiko. He then said, quote, I am a descendant of the sun god. I shot an arrow toward the sun, so I was punished. King Ajachasatru paid homage to the Buddha Shakyamuni and returned to his palace. During the night, he dreamed that the sun fell down on the earth. Greatly surprised, the king told his retainers about it, all of his advisors, they said that it might be a sign of the Buddha's extinction. Seeing the Buddha, Shakyamuni, as a, the sun, or a representation or an embodiment of the sun gods, he might be in failing health. That might be what the dream was about. Subhadra, the last disciple of the Buddha, also had the same kind of dream. Dreams of shooting the sun or the falling sun must necessarily be abhorred in this country. We have a long history of seeing this as a very bad omen. The god of this country is called the sun goddess, right? Japan, the land of the rising sun. And the land is called the origin of the sun. So right away, you went, well, yeah, so this story by Chikaku, he's stepping all over his own face in, in reinterpreting this shooting the sun as a good omen? Why did that work? The Buddha Shakyamuni is called Sun Seed. It is because when he was conceived... Queen Maya had a dream of being impregnated with a child of the sun. Grandmaster Chikaku enshrined an image of the great sun Buddha on Mount Hiei, abandoning that of Buddha Shakyamuni and respecting the three sutras of the Shingon Buddhism. He became an enemy of the three sutras of the Lotus Buddhism. So his dream had to be unlucky. Everything points to that. For example, Shan Dao in China at first read the Lotus Sutra under the guidance of Ming Shen at Mi uh, Chao, but later he met Tao Chou. He threw away the Lotus Sutra. In his commentary on the Sutra of Meditation on the Buddha of Infinite Life, he claims that the Lotus Sutra is a sutra through which even one out of a thousand cannot be reborn in the pure land. Remember that whole thing about the death cult type idea. Because the only way you can attain enlightenment is after you your body dies. Well, enlightenment is a state of mind. So how, <laughs> without a body that emerges a mind, can the mind experience enlightenment if there's no apparatus for it to emerge? It just, it makes no sense. And this is what Nietzsche is, is appealing 
to the senses, the reason, the rationality of his audience, especially his audience here being the progenitors of Buddhism, the propagators of Buddhism from his alma mater. While claiming that the Nembutsu, chanting the name of the Buddha of infinite life, of, um, Ashvagosha? No, no, no. Uh, oh, come on, Selene. Is it in here somewhere else? Oh, yes. Uh, Vairochana, right? That truly, uh, chanting his name is the way through which 10 out of 10, 100 out of 100 can be reborn in the pure land. Well, you don't have to prove it, do you? Because nobody's going to find out till after they're dead. It's really easy to claim anything. I'll tell you what. I'll cl I'll make a claim right now. When when you die, when you this life is over for you, you're going to go to hmm, let's see a pub that serves exclusively uh, Chicago style deep dish pizza. And you'll be surrounded by fresh, hot pizza for the rest of time. Prove me wrong. <laughs> oh my goodness, the things our imaginations will allow us to adopt as real. See, that's Buddhism is constantly trying to break this habit that we have of magical, mystical thinking. It's very earthy. It's about living this life to its fullest. There is no other life for you to experience. Make this one count. That's Buddhism. By making this one count, you alter the entirety of the universe, time, space, because you are life affirming. And that energy is what everything is of and everything returns to without specificity. This potential that's manifested is manifested moment to moment. When it ceases to, to manifest in this corporeal form, it goes on to do other things. It, it dis dissolves into its basic form, just energy without expression. It's not a continuing soul. It's not a continuing bag of Betty. That bag of Betty exists only here in this life experience because this is where the container called you or me exists. This is where it manifests and it's constantly changing moment to moment. I've never met a 90-year-old like Benjamin Button, that looks like an infant child. Just doesn't happen that way. Things instantiate, arise over time. They express themselves until they express themselves right out of existence. That's a life. Stars do this. Let's continue. In order to make sure whether or not this doctrine meets the intention of the Buddha, he meditated in front of the image of the Buddha of infinite life. He made an image of Vajrachana Buddha and he started praying to it, right? Like this image was going to imbue him with enlightenment. Again, we say meditation because it's an eternal process. We don't allow our life energy to be constructed by something else it's it's within our own mind and experience that we find reality rationality and buddhahood clarity it all happens in here we don't go to the store and buy in the frozen food section enlightenment and go home and nuke it so we can have buddhahood that's how silly this stuff is
Then he claimed <laughs> he was guided by a monk who appeared in his dream every night to instruct him. Okay, I mean, how many times have you listened to voices in your head or had dreams about a situation that you thought opened your mind up to some possibilities, but that's your mind working through possibilities, and maybe you get insights that way, absolutely, but that's your mind, not some messenger from elsewhere, yes? He also said that his commentary represents the intent of the Buddha, so it should be revered as though it were a sutra. And he named his commentary the Sutra of the Merit of Meditation, not prayer, on the Buddha of Infinite Life. See, that's why these translations, the bias trips all over itself. <laughs> In the Lotus Sutra, it said, quote, anyone who hears this Dharma will never fail to become a Buddha. But Shandao said, quote, not even one out of 1,000 will obtain Buddhahood through this sutra. W whose opinion is that? The sutra itself contradicts you. So what do you think you're achieving by making this stupid claim? You're disagreeing with the founder of Buddhism, the very teaching you profess to be practicing. You're, you're totally controverting it. Who the hell are you? Right? This is Shantao. Thus, the Lotus Sutra and Shandao are as different as fire and water. Duh. Shandao said that the Sutra of Meditation on the Buddha of Infinite Life is the Sutra by which, quote, 10 out of 10, 100 out of 100 can be reborn in the Pure Land. While it is said in the Sutra of Infinite Meaning, the prologue to the Lotus Sutra, that the Sutra of Meditation on the Buddha of Infinite Life, quote, has not yet revealed the truth, end quote because it's one of the previous sutras taught prior to the Lotus Sutra. So the Sutra of Infinite Meaning and what Shandao preached are as different as the heaven and earth. Honen, however, writes in his collection of passages on the Nembutsu that Shandao's dream means that the Buddha of Infinite Life appeared as a monk to verify that Shandao was right. They just continue this baloney rhetoric throughout Chikaku to Shandao to Honen. And they just justify their own story by, by, it's like politics. I know what I'm saying is bullshit. I know that I'm saying something completely wrong. And everyone can see it's a lie. But I'm going to keep repeating it until everyone goes, yeah, we'll repeat that lie with you. We'll be part of your lying club. And that is now reality. How often do we see that in today's political world? Hmm. Scary, isn't it? How do we do that as human, conscious human beings? Consciously choose to be incorrect and laud ourselves for it. How do we feel proud of being full of baloney? How is that a prideful moment? Yet people do it all the time, right? It makes me beyond sad. It, made me, it makes me lose confidence in human beings. And I don't like feeling that way. So again, thank you for being here because you raise my confidence. You make me feel alive. These people do not. They're professing anti-life. Was not the Buddha of infinite life present at the assembly of the Lotus Sutra? Verifying the Sutra to be true by extending his tongue? Oh yeah. Yeah, why are you saying that that Buddha contravenes Shakyamuni when he was one of the witnesses that proved Shakyamuni to be true? It, it, it's just, if you just use your reasoning, rational mind, all of this baloney just falls away. 
all of these lies, no matter how smiley and wild-eyed the people are who say it, it just makes you avert their gaze, doesn't it? Oh, my God. You're so... Oh. Yeah, it's frustrating. Were not Bodhisattvas Avalokitsvara and um, Stamaprata, who sit on both sides of the Buddha of Infinite Life, present at the assembly of the Lotus Sutra? Of course, it's documented. This false dream of Shantao makes us see the ominous nature of the dream of Grandmaster Chikaku that was at the foundation at the beginning of of all of this craziness. Next section, doubts of about Grandmaster Kobo. So somebody asks a question. Of course, this is Nietzsche posing the question. But he understands there are these factions around him, so he's going to voice their question. In the secret key to the essence of the Wisdom Sutra, Grandmaster Kobo says, so he's going to quote, a writing of Grandmaster Kobo, when he says, when an epidemic spread the ninth year of the Konan era in 818, remember we read that earlier, Emperor Saga personally copied a facile of the essence of the Wisdom Sutra on dark blue paper in gold paint, as was the tradition then. Appointing a lecturer, I lectured on the essence of the Wisdom Sutra. I finished saying my before I finish saying my, or ending my meditation, many patients recovered. That night, the sun appeared shining brightly. This was not due to the merits of my keeping the precepts, but was entirely due to the emperor's conviction. Oh, what a holy man. What a, what a, just egoless statement. At the end, before I finished my meditation, everybody got well. Am I not great? Oh, but this wasn't due to my meditation. This was because the or emperor ordered me to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> False modesty, yeah? One thing I must tell you is that those who pay homage to shrines should read this secret key to the essence of the Wisdom Sutra. I once listened to the Buddha Shakyamuni preach this profound doctrine on Mount Sacred Eagle. Oh, really? You were there 3,000 years ago when he preached the Lotus Sutra. How interesting. So this book of the secret key to the essence of the Wisdom Sutra exactly reveals the doctrine of the essence of the Wisdom Sutra. How pathetic. In the commentary on the Peacock Sutra, it's, it is said, quote, On returning to Japan, Grandmaster Kobo assembled many people of the various schools in the imperial court, hoping to establish the Shingon school. The people there all had doubts about the doctrine of becoming a Buddha within one's present body, even though the Lotus Sutra is all about that. But okay, so Shingon comes along, Mr. Kobo. Grandmaster Kobo made the symbolic finger signs, the mudras, right? Of the great sun Buddha in the diamond realm and faced to the south. So now he's going to impersonate the great sun Buddha. Then his mouth suddenly opened and he became Golden Vairochana Buddha, the great sun Buddha with the Dharma body. He transformed right there in front of everyone. <gasps> he is the great sun Buddha. The next moment he changed back. Did you catch that moment? Remember we talked about moments in the last video or the one before? How long is a moment? So... Was that a momentary apparition? Did he have something shiny on and the sun hit him and <gasps> he was Virachana? Use your mind. 
Now nobody has any doubt about the doctrine that the Dharma body of the great Sun Buddha is one self, and one self is the Dharma body of the great Sun Buddha, or the doctrine of one's becoming a Buddha with one's present body. The sacred mandala teaching of the Mantra Yoga school had been established since this time. Sounds like a snake oil salesman, right? He makes something shiny happen and everyone goes, ah, he's right, he's right. He's appropriating the teachings of the Lotus Sutra and assigning them to himself, basically. And so these realizations, quote unquote, are made by people who are just attached to spectacle, to watching something. They're not achieving anything in themselves. They're just watching a show and being impressed by it. That's not Buddhism. It says also, quote, it was at this time that the scholars of the various schools began to surrender to Grandmaster Kobo, believing in mantras, sp magic spells, and desiring to learn and practice it. Among them are Dosho of the Sanran, Genin of the Hoso, Doyu of Kigan, and Encho of the Tendai in Japan. This is when the Tendai school lost its way, right? The biography of Grandmaster Kobo declares, quote, when he was to leave China for Japan by boat, he threw a three-pronged Vajra toward Japan, praying that, or, <laughs> praying that, <laughs> that it should land where the teachings of the Buddha he had learned should be spread. It flew up in the sky and disappeared in a cloud. His good arm. He arrived in Japan in the 10th month. It also states, quote, Grandmaster Kobo decided to enter meditation at the foot of Mount Koya, where he found the Vajra he had thrown over the sea from China. <laughs> really strong arm. Think he had a helper, maybe? Hmm. Such incidents representing the virtue of Grandmaster Kobo are too numerous to mention them all. I have cited here only a few. How can anyone not believe in such a man of virtue and claim that he had fallen into the hell of incessant suffering? Nietzscheman. <laughs> well. <laughs> Whew. Okay. Here's Nietzscheman's answer. Your question is reasonable. I, too, respect and believe in Grandmaster Kobo. I, however, know of some people who worked wonders in ancient days, but did not prove their correctness in Buddhism by virtue of their wonders. So, if a teacher calls himself a great, a grand master of Buddhism, and tries to prove it to you, by virtue of the number of somersaults he or she can do, or how many eggs they can stuff into their body before they explode, uh, what the hell does that have to do with Buddhism or the teachings of Shakyamuni? It's just spectacle. Maybe they're very talented. Is that proof of Buddhism? Um, maybe not. Of non-Buddhist practicers in India, a hermit kept the Ganges River in his ears for 12 years. <laughs> Another swallowed up the ocean in a day. Still another grasped the sun and moon by hand or transformed the Buddha's disciples into cows and sheep. They worked such wonders as these which made them too proud and self-conceited, piling up seeds of illusions. Referring to this, Grandmaster Tendai said, quote, Seeking fame and profit, they increased evil passions. Yeah. Profound meaning of the Lotus Sutra. 
Monk Fa Yun of the Quan Che Temple could cause it to rain instantly or shower flowers by giving lectures on the Lotus Sutra. Yet Grandmaster Miao said of him, quote, It does not fit the teachings of the Lotus Sutra to show such wonders. That was in his commentary on the profound meaning of the Lotus Sutra. Therefore, although Grandmaster Tendai made nectar rain immediately upon giving lectures of the Lotus Sutra, and Grandmaster Dengyo caused nectar to rain in three days, they never claimed that such miracles met the wishes of the Buddha. These are just folklore aggrandizing their scholarship and their teachings. Understand with your mind of reason and rationale what the meaning of the teachings are. Don't take them literally. No matter how wonderful Grandmaster Kobo was, no wise man should accept this declaration that the Luda Sutra was of no use or that the Buddha Shakyamuni was not enlightened. Who the hell, whose teachings are you practicing? That is the most unreasonable, irrational, just a flat out stupid statement to make. Besides, his wonders mentioned above are, in fact, incredible. You can't give them credit as actual events. Come on. Grandmaster Kobo says that epidemics prevailed in the spring of the ninth year of the Cohen era, 818. We're back there again. Spring consists of 90 days. Which of the 90 days does he mean? <laughs> This is the first doubt. Is it true that epidemics prevailed in the ninth year of the Koenen era? This is the second doubt. When Kobo prayed in a ceremony to stamp out epidemics, the sun is said to have appeared at midnight, shining brightly. This is a matter of great importance. I wonder whether or not this is recorded by official historians of the left and right in the history of the ninth year of the Konin era, during the reign of Emperor Saga. This is the third doubt. Well, did that happen? Even if it's recorded, it's hard to believe. The appearance of the sun at midnight has never occurred for 29 kalpa from the beginning of the universe, 20 kalpa of creation, till today, ninth kalpa of existence. Such an incident cannot be found in the records of the three emperors and five rulers in ancient China. In the Buddha Sutras, it is mentioned in the Kalpa when the length of a human life gets shorter, two, three, or seven suns might appear, but they might appear in the daytime. If the sun appears at midnight, what would happen to the three continents in the east and west and north? Oh, oh there's a reasonable argument. Ouch! Even if the sun appeared at midnight where you are right now, would it also appear to those on the other side of the planet? Ouch, logic. Where did this sun appear at midnight? It's just not feasible. Even though no record can be found in the scriptures of Buddhism and Confucianism, if you insist that it really happy to, uh, happened, tell me at what time of the night or on what date of the ninth era of Konin era, 818, it happened. Such an incredible assertion could be trusted little, a little bit if it were recorded in the diaries of the court nobles and other families on Mount Hye, but no record has been found at all. This is just something invented. So Nietzsche is really pounding this into the minds of those he's talking to because they won't let go. They like these mysteries and these ideas and they treat them like they're real. We see this in all of the religions of the world and in the politics of the world. Buddhism is none of those things and therefore doesn't accept that kind of reasoning. It sees it as flowery hyperbole to describe ideas 
think conceptions within the mind, but not reality itself. Buddha is about reality itself, not this fanciful blah, blah, blah. Following this, Grandmaster Kobo says, quote, I once listened to the profound teaching directly from Shakyamuni Buddha at an assembly for his lecture on Mount Sacred Eagle, or Eagle Peak, or Vulture Peak, depends on the translation you're reading, right? Basically, the Sermon of the Lotus Sutra. This is a great lie aiming at deceiving people, isn't it? Do you really think Kobo was alive for 3,000 years? I wondered whether or not Shakyamuni Buddha declared the Lotus Sutra to be a deceitful discourse and the Great Sun Buddha Sutra to be true at the assembly on the Sacred Eagle, Mount Sacred Eagle, while Ananda and the Bodhisattva Manjushri recorded the Lotus Sutra to be true by mistake. <laughs> Even Lady Izumi, a humble poetist, and monk knowing a monk without precepts could cause the rain to fall by composing poems. Even with the 21 day meditations, Grand Mas or, uh, yeah, Grandmaster Kobo could not make the rain fall. Let's just say what it is. How can such a monk work wonders? This is the fourth doubt. In the commentary on the Peacock Sutra, it is said, quote, when Grandmaster Kobo faced the south and made the finger signs of the great, <clears throat> sorry, the great Buddha in the Diamond Realm, the great sun Buddha in the Diamond Realm, the gate of his face, mouth, suddenly opened and he became golden Vairochana Buddha, the great sun Buddha with the Dharma body, end quote. In what year and under what emperor's reign did it happen? Because you know how fastidious all these documents are dated with the hour, the sign of the year, blah, blah, blah. No such mention in that story. Chen Huan and Taiho are the beginnings of the year names in China and Japan, respectively. Since then, every important matter, worldly or non-worldly, is recorded under a year name. Why are not such important incidents recorded with names of the reigning emperors and their ministers with year names, times, and dates? Exactly what I was just saying. That is the form. It is also said, quote, Dosho of Sanran and Genin of Hoso Doyu of Kigon and Encho of Tendai are among those who submitted themselves to Grandmaster Kobo to learn Shingon ex esotericism from him. End quote. As you know, Encho, Encho, who was called Grandmaster Jack, uh, Jackal, was the second chief abbot of the Tendai school. Why were not Gishin, the first chief abbot, and Grandmaster Dengyo? the founder of the Tendai School in Japan, invited by Grandmaster Kobo. Encho is a disciple of Grandmaster Dengyo, but at the same time, he was a disciple of Grandmaster Kobo. He should have invited both Dengyo and Geishin to the Tendai School rather than his own disciples and scholars of the Sanran, Hoso, and Kigan schools. What Nichiren is pointing here to is that these statements are irrespective of a calendar of actual time. Suddenly, well, I mean, he was there 3,000 years ago listening to Shakyamuni preach the Lotus Sutra. So, you know, can he, I guess he's a time traveler. Is that reasonable? In this diary, moreover, it is recorded that the secret mandala teaching of the Mantra Yoga school had been established at that time. This seems to have been written at a time when Dengyo and Gishin were alive. Kobo propagated Shingon from the second year of the Daido era in 807 to the 13th year of the Konin era in 822 in the reign of Emperor Hitsi. Dengyo and Gishin were still alive then. It was until the 10th of the Ten Tensho era, 833, that Gishin lived. 
Kobo did not invite them while in, uh, inviting the second chief, Abbot Echo. Does it mean that Shingon of Kobo had not been spread until the 10th of the Tencho era in 833? There are many questions to be answered. Again, pointing out that there's no reasonable, rational justification, let alone indemnification for these statements. They're just drivel. The commentary on the Peacock Sutra was written by Shinzei, a disciple of Kobo. It cannot be trusted, however. Shinzei was of false view, he, was he not? He should have quoted from what was written by court nobles, various scholars, or Encho. He should have examined also what Dosho, Genin, and Doyu wrote. His commentary says, quote, The gate of his face suddenly opened and he, Kobo, became golden Varachana uh, Buddha, end quote. The gate of his face means his mouth. Did his mouth open? Probably he meant to say his forehead opened, but possibly he wrote by mistake, the gate of his face opened. Trying to deceive the world, he might have made a foolish mistake like this. It also says, when Grandmaster faced the south and made the finger signs of the great sun Buddha in the diamond realm, the gate of his face suddenly opened and he became golden Virachana Buddha. It is said, however, in the sixth facile of the Nirvana Sutra, that Kashyapa said to the Buddha, quote, Lord Buddha, I will not trust those four ranks of Buddhist leaders after the death of the Buddha. It is because you have preached the Gosita in the Gosita Sutra, the Kushira Kyo, quote, the king of devils with intentions of destroying Buddhism may sometimes appear in disguise of a Buddha with 32 or 80 marks of physical excellence. Shining and peaceful, he may look like the full moon. <laughs> the curl on his forehead may be as white as snow, and he may emit water from the left side of his body and fire from the right side. <laughs> End quote. In the seventh facile of the same sutra, the Buddha preaches to Bodhisattva Kashyapa, quote, After my extinction, the demons will gradually destroy my true teachings. Being in illusion, they will pretend to be arhats or Buddhas, destroying my true dharma, end quote. Grandmaster Kobo, who declared that the Lotus Sutra was a useless argument in comparison with the Flower Garland Sutra and the Great Sun Buddha Sutra, is said to have shown himself to be a Buddha, like Vairochana, right? This is referred to in the Nirvana Sutra that demons, though they are full of illusions, appear as Buddhas and will destroy the true Dharma. The true Dharma referred to in the Nirv uh, Nirvana Sutra is the Lotus Sutra. Therefore, following the statement cited above in the seventh facile, it is stated that the Buddha has long been enlightened. The ninth facile of the Nirvana Sutra states, quote, in the Lotus Sutra, 8,000 Shravaka were assured of obtaining Buddhahood in the future. It means that the great harvest in autumn to be stored for the winter was finished by the Lotus Sutra, leaving the gleaning to the Nirvana Sutra. The Buddha Shakyamuni, the Buddha of many treasures, and the Buddhas in manifestation from the worlds in the ten directions, the universe, declared that the Lotus Sutra was true, and all the rest of the sutras, including the Great Sun Buddha Sutra, were expedient. Grandmaster Kobo, however, appearing as Virochana Buddha, says that the Lotus Sutra was a useless argument in comparison to the Flower Garland and the Great Sun Buddha Sutras. If what is preached by the Buddha in Nirvana Sutra is true, is not Komo, uh, uh, Kobo a uh, heavenly devil? Isn't he one of those things identified as a great destroyer of Buddhism? His story about the three-pronged Vajra is especially doubtful. <laughs> He's in a boat. Wherever it lands is where Buddhism should be uh, taught. And then he crosses the ocean to Japan 
goes to a mountain in Japan, sits himself down to meditate and goes, oh, look, <laughs> there's that Vajra. You see how important I am? <laughs> it's such crap. Probably someone had been sent to bury it there beforehand. Ouch! Nitrin, you detective you. <laughs> Kobo could have done it, for he is a, a Japanese. Kobo could have done it, for he is a Japanese. He often deceived the people with such things as these. Therefore, we cannot accept these as proof that he was in agreement with the intention of the Buddha. He was usurping you, the Buddha. Poser. All right, that's long enough for today. <laughs> I love the way Nietzsche doesn't pull any punches. Sometimes he gets a little bit too detailed, but you have to consider the people he's talking to. Try to convince. Uh, I, I, I have to resist getting into politics because I, I respect all of you and all of us, including myself, have gone down some pretty strange paths in our lives to get back to reasonableness and rationale and practice correctly. All we can do is enshrine our mandalas Chant Namo Myoren Geikyo morning and evening. Spend some time reciting the sutra and just keep working toward achieving our enlightened state and maintaining it through the day. Not an easy task. But Nichiren certainly not shy about offering his analysis and his opinion. But he stands on solid ground, doesn't he? Because everything he can quote in the sutras from Shakyamuni are borne out. And they're quite direct statements. All right. That's it for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Use the website. Get, you know, use the bookstore. Get a mandala. If you don't have one already, please. Keep chanting, keep your practice strong, be kind to yourself, and I'll see you in the next one, okay? Thank you. Don't forget our patrons, those of you who support this channel. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Keep up your bodhisattva work. And I'll see you again. Bye for now. <laughs>